after murdering two escorts and being sentenced to a psychiatric hospital. In 2010, Russian man Alexei Varakin was said to have been cured of his violent impulses. He'd fatally stabbed the victims after they caught him rummaging and stealing from their purses. However, Varakin's psychological condition improved enough over the next several years that he was eventually released back into civilian life sometime in late 2023. With his newfound freedom, Varakin isolated himself at a hotel in Moscow. One night, he invited over an escort by the name of Olga Vorobayova, aged 40. He became incensed after the woman refused to serve him because she'd taken some drugs that night. Varakin reportedly became so unhinged following Vorobayova's refusal that he viciously attacked her with a knife, beheading her before fleeing the scene. The following day, the man arranged to meet another escort, Vlada Skitskaya, in order to de-stress from the murder. They met at the 25-year-old escort's high-rise apartment in Moscow, where Varakin was unable to perform in bed because he'd been binge drinking. Skitskaya mocked the impotent man, which only served to further upset and enrage him. He attacked her with a knife. Though the young woman put up a fight, at one point managing to gain control of the weapon and slash Varakin's face. In the end, however, the man overpowered her. Law enforcement officers were dispatched to the scene where they found Skitskaya dead with evidence of an attempted decapitation. Police were able to track down Varakin and take him into custody, whereupon he confessed to both murders. Following his arrest, an investigation was launched to determine whether Varakin was responsible for any other escort killings. Number 5. Stephen Bonnelly, William Hughes, and Marcus Miller. In 2007, a disabled Englishman was murdered in cold blood in the neighborhood of Townend Farm in Sunderland, Tyne and Weir. The victim, 23-year-old Brent Martin, repeatedly begged his three attackers for mercy, asking them to be his friends and even telling them that he loved them as they ruthlessly beat him. Martin was kicked, stomped on, and humiliated by the assailants, identified as Stephen Bonnelly, William Hughes, and Marcus Miller, who were each 21 years old or younger at the time. Following the appalling attack, the three young men left Martin to die with his pants around his ankles. They were all eventually apprehended and charged with murder. 21-year-old Hughes and Miller, aged 16, pleaded guilty and were given life sentences. Meanwhile, Bonnelly, at the time aged 17, elected to bring his case to trial, where he was convicted and given the same punishment as his accomplices. Bonnelly's minimum term, initially set at 18 years, was reduced to 15 years in late 2008. Eight years later, it was reduced once again following a second review by a high court judge in London. A remorseful Bonnelly was released from prison in 2022. Later that year, during the early morning hours of New Year's Eve, the now 32-year-old was behind the wheel of a silver Audi A6 estate car near Durham city centre. Just before 2 a.m., Bonnelly lost control of the vehicle and crashed into a tree. He was taken to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. Another man, said to be in his 30s, was in the car at the time of the crash and was left severely injured as a result. Fortunately, after several weeks at Durham Constabulary, he was discharged. The family of Brent Martin responded to news of Bonnelly's death by publicly sending condolences to his loved ones. As of the latest developments, the accident that killed Bonnelly was still being investigated. Number 4. Daniel Whelan, Katie Whelan, Nigel Ives, and Gavin Buckle. In October of 2016, an English man with learning disabilities was imprisoned by four merciless tormentors inside a flat in Waterlooville, Hampshire. Although the victim wasn't initially identified for legal reasons, it was described in court how his life was made unbearable by the group that was preying on him. Daniel and Katie Whelan, aged 25 and 22, owned the apartment where the situation unfolded and had reportedly allowed the victim to stay with them temporarily. The Whelans were helped by 30-year-old Gavin Buckle and Nigel Ives, aged 28. Together, they inflicted relentless physical violence on the disabled man and even made him dance in front of a camera naked 
for their depraved amusement. Furthermore, the gang was accused of forcing the victim to drink urine and vinegar, as well as pouring chili powder and bleach on him. To prevent the man from trying to flee, Buckle threatened to hunt down his family and murder them with machetes if he didn't submit to their torture. Fortunately, the victim ultimately escaped the harrowing ordeal with his life and his four attackers were arrested. The Whelans attempted to absolve themselves of responsibility, claiming that they were doing Buckle's bidding out of fear. Nevertheless, Daniel was charged with assault and administering poison, while both he and Katie were charged with causing fear of violence. During proceedings at Portsmouth Crown Court in 2018, the couple were jailed for four and a half years and two and a half years, respectively. Buckle and Ives both admitted assault and were respectively given six and a half and four year prison sentences as punishment. Number three, Rad Al-Mansouri. On February the 8th of 2024, career criminal Rad Al-Mansouri arranged to meet an escort at the Soho 54 Hotel in Manhattan. The 26-year-old got into an argument with the woman, identified as Denise Olias Arancivia, about how long he could stay with her that night. As tensions escalated, Al-Mansouri subsequently tried to strangle her. She fought back, but the man only redoubled his efforts, attempting to break her neck with his bare hands. Al-Mansouri then stomped on her head several times and crushed her skull with an iron before leaving her to die. The hotel surveillance system recorded Al-Mansouri walking out of the building while wearing the victim's pink leggings as his own pants had reportedly gotten soaked in blood. Olias Arancibia, a 38-year-old mother of two from Queens, was found dead in the hotel room with a bloody iron next to her. As the NYPD geared up to hunt for Al-Mansouri, he fled the state, eventually landed in Arizona. On February the 17th, the man carjacked and stabbed a woman in Phoenix. The following day, Al-Mansouri went to a McDonald's in the city of Surprise. He followed a female employee in the bathroom where he allegedly crawled into her stall, pepper sprayed her and knifed her in the neck as she desperately cried out for help. Fortunately, the 18-year-old victim survived the ordeal and was treated in the intensive care unit at the hospital. Meanwhile, Scottsdale police zeroed in on Al-Mansouri at a parking garage and finally took him into custody. He proceeded to boast about the murder he committed at Soho 54, urging the arresting officers to Google the hotel in order to learn about the case, which he described to them in graphic detail. Al-Mansouri tried to justify his actions by stating, not a single woman on this planet likes me, so I was very upset. For his multi-state crime spree, the man faced a litany of charges including murder, attempted murder, kidnapping, and assault. Today's topic was requested by Daniel Sandberg, 5298. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Evelyn Rodriguez Jonathan Gonzalez and Jason Chavez On the evening of November the 6th of 2023, the Lee County Sheriff's Office in Florida received reports of a physical altercation near 26th Street Southwest in Lehigh Acres. Upon arrival, officers encountered a man in a wheelchair with injuries to his hands, knees, and upper body. Investigators learned that the disabled individual, who wasn't named, had been heading home that night when he was accosted by a mother and her two sons. The woman, identified as 39-year-old Evelyn Rodriguez, reportedly exited her vehicle, approached the victim and began to strike him with a metal pipe. The man who managed to record the incident with his cell phone produced a pocket knife to defend himself. It was at that point that Rodriguez's sons, Jonathan Gonzalez and Jason Chavez, stepped out of the vehicle and joined the fight. They took turns viciously beating the victim who'd been accused of stalking Rodriguez and her family. He was also accused of slashing three of their tires, as well as faking his disability, though none of the family's allegations were substantiated by the Lee County Sheriff's Office. In the aftermath, Rodriguez and her sons were arrested on charges of aggravated battery with a deadly weapon and assault of a disabled person. The matter hadn't yet been resolved as of the latest available updates. Straight after number one, 
We will line up our release on when illegal activities go wrong. Stick around if you missed that episode a while ago. Number 1. Emma Mansfield, Casey Jackson and Nicholas Haskins A pair of women from the town of Pontypool in South Wales lured a vulnerable man with Asperger's syndrome into a violent trap. On August the 15th of 2015, at about 1 a.m., the victim, 31-year-old Michael Telfer, received a text from a woman named Casey Jackson. She claimed that she could see the devil in her apartment and asked Telfer to come over. The latter obliged the woman's request and upon arrival at the flat, she asked him to have a look in the bathroom for her. As Telfer entered the bathroom, Jackson's brother, Nicholas Haskins, sprung out of the closet punched him in the face and started shouting at him. Eventually, Haskins calmed down and apologized to Telfer, whom he subsequently left alone in the apartment with Jackson and her friend, Emma Mansfield. The latter threatened the man with kitchen knives before grabbing a meat cleaver and using it to slash him in the arm and leg. Telfer phoned the emergency services and was taken to the hospital, where his wounds were stitched up. The man's attackers were each arrested for conspiracy to commit grievous bodily harm. The trio admitted the crime for which they were sentenced in January of 2016. Judge Jonathan Furness of Cardiff Crown Court stated that he took the defendant's history of mental illness into account when handing down their punishments. Mansfield and Jackson were each jailed for seven years and four months, while Haskins was sentenced to just 15 months. A former drug kingpin released a memoir in February of 2022, detailing the events that led to him running the largest high-end marijuana wholesaler on the east coast of the United States while he was still in college. Eric Conori began selling marijuana when he was in 11th grade at a high school in Queensbury, New York. He continued dealing while attending the State University of New York at Plattsburgh. By his early 20s, he'd built his illicit business into a multi-million dollar drug enterprise. In his book, Kanori claimed to have smuggled more than $300 million worth of marijuana, leading him to describe his unlawful empire as a Fortune 500 company. In 2012, federal investigators finally caught up with the man and he was ultimately sent to prison for 30 months for marijuana conspiracy. Kanori's memoir revealed that he'd been subjected to lighter punishment due to his cooperation with the authorities, which included leading DEA agents into the woods of upstate New York, where he'd hidden $10 million worth of gold bars. Following the release of his book, Kanori announced his plans to apply for a license to become a legal marijuana vendor, boasting, I understand the high-end cannabis market on the East Coast probably better than anybody. Number 7. Hardin Street Raid On January the 8th of 2019, the police in Houston, Texas, received a call from a woman named Patricia Ann Garcia, who claimed that her neighbors were engaged in criminal activity involving illicit substances and guns. Based on the information, Officer Gerald Goines obtained a no-knock search warrant for the purported drug house, which was located on Hardin Street. To support his case for the warrant, Goines lied claiming the department had a confidential informant who'd purchased black tar heroin in a hand-to-hand -hand transaction conducted at the Harding Street residence. In reality, the police had no such testimony to legitimize Garcia's allegations against her neighbors. Nevertheless, the no-knock raid was carried out on January the 28th, roughly three weeks after the woman's initial call. Upon entering the home, Officers shot the resident's dog. According to the Houston Police Department's official reports, they were subsequently met by Dennis Wayne Tuttle, who was armed with a revolver. Gunfire was exchanged, and Tuttle was killed. The man's living partner, Regina Ann Nicholas, was gunned down by a backup officer after allegedly reaching for a wounded officer's weapon. Investigators seized a small quantity of marijuana and cocaine from the house, but no heroin. The drugs found were described as having been user amounts not distributor levels. Three months after the raid, the Tuttle and Nicholas families hired a forensic team to reprocess the crime scene. Upon doing so, the private investigators found no evidence that the occupants of the house had fired upon the officers as they entered, as was claimed in the official police report. Furthermore, the forensic team expressed their belief based on the evidence collected that the officers had blindly fired through the walls during the raid. A few months later, in November, a federal grand jury returned indictments on federal charges for Officer Goins as well as Officer Stephen Bryant, 
In connection to the ill-conceived Harding Street raid, a Harris County grand jury further indicted Goins with tampering with government documents and felony murder. As of June of 2021, a total of 11 Houston officers had been indicted. Garcia, meanwhile, pleaded guilty to making the false call lead into the raid and was consequently sentenced to 40 months in federal prison. Number 6. Anaheim Slap House Shortly before 8 a.m. on October the 13th of 2020, the police in Anaheim, California raided an alleged illegal gambling operation that was fronting as a hydroponics business. At least 13 suspects were arrested at the so-called slap house, a phrase that refers to the sound of players slapping the controls of the gambling games, which can be heard outside the business. Police, firefighters and the SWAT team showed up at the building and deployed flashbangs before forcing their way inside. In addition to those taken into custody, more than 70 individuals were detained while investigators sorted things out. 25 of the detainees were cited for various offenses, including drug possession. The 13 suspects arrested faced criminal charges stemming from active warrants, parole and probation violations, as well as gambling violations. While speaking to the media in the raid's aftermath, an Anaheim police sergeant described how the presence of slap houses can, in turn, attract other criminal activity, including violent muggings, drug use, and escorts. An anonymous informant told law enforcement that whenever the owners of the illicit gambling operation would lose money, they'd prowl on the town and commit assaults and robberies to recoup their losses. The most recent updates indicated the case's legal proceedings were still ongoing. Number 5. Gary Losh On July the 30th of 2017, British Columbia woman Chelsea Gortier was reported missing to the Abbotsford Police Department by her family. A massive search for the 22-year-old mother of two ensued. Then 17 days after her initial disappearance, Gortier's remains were found near Sylvester Road and Dale Road, northeast of the city of Mission. Five years of investigation left law enforcement with little to go on in their effort to ascertain what exactly happened to the young woman. In September of 2022, however, the case finally experienced new developments. Officers with the Integrated Homicide Investigation Team arrested a man by the name of Gary Losh on suspicion of second-degree murder and interference with a dead body. The 67-year-old man reportedly owned an illegal outdoor marijuana growing operation which Gautier had been a part of in some capacity. The specific nature of the disagreement between Losh and the victim wasn't immediately made clear. The man was held in custody while awaiting a court appearance scheduled for January of 2023. Earlier that month, coroner Laurie Moen released a report detailing how Gautier's official cause of death was determined to be a stab wound to the torso and that her death had therefore been classified as a homicide. Number 4. Corvina House Restaurant In early October of 2022, Florida police raided the Corvina House Restaurant on Coral Way in southwest Miami-Dade. After learning that it was moonlighting as an illegal nightclub, law enforcement initially caught wind of the seafood restaurant's criminal activity through anonymous tips. A sting operation was then set into motion during the course of which undercover officers befriended the nightclub's regulars and ended up purchasing narcotics from the waitresses. Investigators also observed the establishment sell alcohol despite not having a liquor license. During the resulting raid, which was conducted on October the 7th, the police seized cash, firearms, alcohol, and illegal substances, including cocaine and MDMA. 11 suspects were taken into custody, one of whom was identified as 37-year-old Daryl Morjon, the business's owner. All 11 were held at the Turner Guilford Knight Correctional Center on drug possession and distribution charges. The restaurant was immediately shut down in the wake of the raid. Number 3. California Fix-It Scheme In December of 2022, California officials publicly detailed a scheme to forge the signatures of highway patrol officers on more than 250 Fix-It tickets. The citations in question had reportedly been issued during illegal street racing operations in Los Angeles and Orange counties. So-called fix-it tickets are given out when a vehicle is in violation for being illegally modified or missing a vital part. If the alleged violator fixes the issue outlined in the document and has a police officer sign off on the corrected infraction, they can avoid facing punishment beyond paying a small fine. 
but according to the California Highway Patrol, a man named Angel Saeed Sanchez Peralta sold forged police signatures for $300 apiece. He was arrested in August of 2020, at which point law enforcement began looking into his clientele. Investigators determined that 27 individuals had paid Sanchez Peralta to fraudulently sign off on their fix-it tickets, and all of them were consequently arrested. While criminal charges hadn't yet been filed against the 27 suspects, as of the latest developments, Sanchez Peralta had been charged with 33 counts of attempt to file a forged instrument in a public office and one count of attempt to procure or offer a false or forged instrument for record. Number 2. Dexter Lab State troopers raided an illegal cannabis extract lab near Dexter, Oregon on October the 23rd of 2019. Police described the operation as having been set up at an out-of-compliance Oregon medical marijuana program grow site. After serving a search warrant to the property owners, law enforcement recovered 10 firearms, one of which was stolen, and hundreds of pounds of illegally possessed marijuana, as well as two extraction machines valued at approximately $120,000. State police also reportedly seized items relating to the manufacture and sale of counterfeit vape cartridges. The authorities had obtained the warrant following a proactive inspection by the Oregon Liquor Control Commission's Medical Marijuana Division. Two suspects were taken into custody during the raid. They both faced charges of unlawful possession of marijuana, unlawful delivery of a marijuana item, and unlawful manufacture of a marijuana item. Number 1. Carla Jacqueline Morales 20-year-old Carla Jacqueline Morales asked a young man to accompany her to a grassy field near an elementary school in Spring, Texas to smoke marijuana. When 24-year-old Jose Villanueva arrived at the meetup location, however, he was ambushed by machete-wielding members of the notorious MS-13. After being ruthlessly hacked by the assailants, Villanueva tried to crawl away, at which point he was fatally shot with a handgun. The victim had reportedly been hiding from the gang, which accused him of disrespecting them during a rap battle. The scheme to lure Villanueva out into the open was devised, at least in part, by Morales, who then facilitated the setup for her violent co-conspirators. The young woman was eventually arrested on murder charges, and prosecutors requested that her bond be set at $250,000. The magistrate judge instead set it at just $100,000 but it was later reduced to $60,000 by a different district court judge. Morales was subsequently freed on the condition that she wear an ankle monitor until she was due back in court for her trial in October of 2021. Just a few days before the trial was scheduled to commence, however, Morales cut off her GPS monitor and absconded. Although she was born in California and had reported ties to Central America, investigators expressed their belief that she might still be in the Houston area. As of the latest updates, her whereabouts remained unknown. Thanks for watching. In your opinion, can people be cured of violent impulses, as Russian authorities erroneously said of Alexei Varakin before letting him back into society?